Thank you for giving me a chance to talk here. Actually, although I think I'm not the right person to talk here, I mean, I'm supposed to be a course organizer. But actually, somebody else organized the course and asked me to give a talk. So uh, I'll give a short, I mean, two lectures today and tomorrow. Uh, it will mostly be about uh, supersymmetric anti-distance space ADS black holes, trying to understand them uh, in a more microscopic manner using the boundary quantum field theories uh, due to this uh, gauge gravity uh, duality. So it will mostly be works uh, that people, including myself, have done very recently at the end of last year. So uh, the rough plan of my lecture goes as follows. So I'll briefly give an introduction about the black holes in anti space and uh, the dual features of gauge theories that we expect. And then I'll turn to more quantitative studies. I'll first explain what kind of studies has been done by people uh, rather long ago, like 10 or 15 years ago, and what was the technical uh, barrier then, and how those could be overcome surprisingly easily in the recent time. Okay. So today I'll try to keep the technical contents hopefully minimal so that you can get the key messages. So I'll try to count a special limit of five-dimensional ADS black holes using a higher dimensional field theory generalization of what we call the Cardi formula of two-dimensional quantum field theories. And in the tomorrow's lecture, I'll discuss about many related subjects, more complicated probably. I'm not even sure how much we, we can discuss, but we'll decide uh, tomorrow. Uh, I don't have to really talk about all of them. So, so uh, uh, this was the time before my birth, but I understand that at the beginning of 70s or something, very curious properties of our classical black holes have been discovered in general relativity. Namely that the black holes respect certain properties or laws reminiscent of the thermodynamic laws of thermal systems. And in this analog, in this, in this pseudo thermodynamic laws of classical black hole solutions, uh, what is called the area of the black hole event horizon is playing the role of entropy of thermal system. And the quantity called kappa, which is the surface gravity of black hole at the event horizon, is supposed to be playing a role very similar to temperature. Okay? So this was a very analogous, this is a kind of law of uh, black hole solutions very much analogous to the thermodynamic laws of ordinary thermal systems. And based on this kind of analogy, people like Jacob Bekenstein really seriously tried to interpret the area of black hole horizon as will the entropy carried by this system, probably the degrees of flow freedom cloak behind the event horizon. And this kind of interpretation has been strengthened by a, a marvelous camp computation by Stephen Hawking who really show that the surface, that the black holes are making certain thermal radiations whose temperatures that are proportional to the surface gravity with precise coefficient fixed. Thereby, the combination of these two works establish what's called the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, given by the area with certain coefficients given by Newton constant and other fundamental constants of nature. This is a striking emergent aspects of gravity, where the, if, if, the, if you really think about this phenomenon, phenomenon seriously, it will be kind of a uh, marvelous emergent aspect of gravity with black holes, including an object's thermal behavior into its uh, gravitational geometry. And this basic fact has triggered lots of interest since then till nowadays. And these kinds of ideas have even provided a good clue and some creative ideas for the quantum gravity itself. Okay. So it's a very important question to understand more uh, conceptually or quantitatively. So people have tried to concretely understand this analogy, analogous thermodynamic behavior really based on statistical me methods, like counting some accessible states of a given system. Okay. So from string theory's point of view, the string theory is supposed to be some UV completion of uh, some UV complete description of quantum gravity. Uh, people have tried to engineer these black holes with certain objects in string theory, like D brains, on which we know a microscopic quantum description, like the gauge theories living on these D brains, or quantum field theories, or quantum mechanics living on certain wrapped brains, and so on. And using this kind of microscopic 
quantum field theory or mechanical description to microscopically account for these emergent gravitational uh, aspects of the, of the, the black hole thermodynamics. It turns out that this emergent gravitational description of black hole thermodynamics requires certain limits like charge being large and so on, which in turn demands that the microscopic description, say using the brains, to be studied at strong coupling limit in various different disguises. So this poses a technical challenge. If you want to develop a statistical interpretation of black hole thermodynamics, you, 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 you mostly ask to study this quantum field or quantum mechanical dynamics at strong coupling, which are generally difficult. So with this kind of situation understood, people try to understand some special class of black holes called supersymmetric or BPS black holes in various settings in which the strong coupling effect might be absent or at least under control. Because with supersymmetry, uh, many physics are uh, uh, argued or proved to be protected. For instance, some spectrum of the states, if it preserves its symmetry, uh, are often argued or proven to be robust under the dialing of the coupling constant. So that you can easily use some weakly coupled field theory analysis or quantum mechanics analysis to really probe the strong coupling region in which the black hole thermodynamics is supposed to be manifest. So along this spirit, the first class of black holes that have been studied successfully was a certain kind of five-dimensional supersymmetric black holes obtained by compactification of string theory or M theory down to five spatial space-time dimensions. The first example studied by these people, Strominger and Waffa and others, can be essentially understood as engineered by D1, D5 brain system, where four of the, the world volume are compactified on cycles, and you're left, out, left with some two-dimensional quantum field theory living on these strings. So if you give momentum to these string states, the entropy of these BPS black holes have been easily counted by what is using the Cardi formula. This theme will be quite important here, so I'll directly explain what the Cardi formula in the 2D quantum field theory is. So you have a partition function of a two-dimensional quantum field theory living on these strings, and it carries a parameter tau. It's a chemical potential. Or geometrically, it's a complex structure of the, po uh, of the porous on which you compactify this quantum Euclidean quantum field theory. This tau is conjugate to what is called the left-moving Hamiltonian, or the BPS momentum that strings can carry along these compactified strings. And when the charge is large, the momentum is large, or equivalently when the th th temperature-like variable is large, it exhibits the characteristic uh, behavior which goes as follows. Okay, so this, this is the Cardi limit behavior of the free energy. Okay. And once you make a Legendre transformation of this at given charges, you get the entropy which takes this form, and people normally call this a Cardi formula, at large momentum, uh, one of these charges, and a given central charge, which in this model is given as this way. So this kind of Cardi formula, asymptotically large charge, has been used to successfully count some of the earliest uh, 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 some of the simplest black holes in five dimensions and four dimensions and so on. Okay. So this is what was happening in mid and late 90s. Soon after, people have realized that there are many more complicated and difficult black holes than those I explained in the, in the previous slide. So people have found many, many more complicated black holes, both in four and five dimensional compactifications of string theory. You can have some single center black holes which I basically explained in the previous slide. You have multi-center black holes, you have some jump of the BPS states, you have some <laughs> bound states, threshold bound states of black holes, you can have some black rings in five dimensions, and all kinds of crazy things. And it turns out that certain black holes, including the ones, let's say, single-centered, very, very simple black holes, are easier to understand. For instance, it admits a Cardi formula counting of its black hole entropy. And certain black holes turned out to be very tricky. For instance, they turn out to be the dominant saddle point at large charges, only in non cardi regime. So it's not really clear what kind of approaches you should use to study them. So many of the black holes, some of the black holes are studied in great detail when they are simple. Others are relatively difficult. Some have been, haven't been studied too much. But anyway, the picture we should generally accept is that we generally expect a zoo, a lot of competing black holes in, a, in any given system. And the study so far, as far as I can see, often uses some ad hoc prescriptions to study, sometimes demands by hand, the particular black holes one wishes to study, 
And uh, sometimes, depending on the object one wishes to study, often employs different effective descriptions. So if you want to count black holes, if you want to count black wings, you use completely different descriptions. And the connection between the two are not clear at all. So having these in mind, it would be quite interesting to have a setting in which one can study the thermodynamics of all possible black holes systematically using a single description. That's what I'm trying to do today and tomorrow. And the natural setting uh, is already explained in my title. It's to study black holes embedded in ADS spacetime. Because we know that in principle, all the phenomena going on in the bulk of ADS should be explainable by boundary conformal field theories. The single unifying description. So I'm going to study the aspects of black holes embedded in this ADS spacetime and try to understand them better using boundary quantum field theories. So let me start by explaining the, possibly the simplest black holes in anti-distance spacetime, and then explain to you the supersymmetric version of that, uh, which we can hope to understand more quantitatively. Surprisingly speaking, <coughs> su surprisingly, the simplest black hole, this Schwarzschild black hole, have some features uh, which shares various aspects together with the more complicated supersymmetric black holes that I'll explain later. So it's, very important to understand the stalian aspects of the simplest black holes in ADS. So to be specific, let us consider the case of ADS-5. Consider the Schwarzschild black holes in ADS, by which I mean it only carries one conserved quantity, just mass, energy, and the conjugate chemical potential is given by the temperature. So the Schwarzschild black hole in ADS is a rotationally symmetric solution in, in global ADS, by which I mean the boundary of this ADS-5 at infinity is S3, and its uh, event horizon of the black hole is also given by C sphere. It's rotationally symmetric with SO4. If you just study the solution and extract out thermodynamic properties, the mass of the black hole, temperature of the black hole in terms of the uh, outer horizon radius, you can find a characteristic relation between this energy and temperature carried by a black hole. So I plotted them. Um, multiplying both quantities by L, which is the radius of ADS-5, and it shows the following plot. So the important feature is that at a given temperature, if the temperature is below a certain amount, there's no black hole, meaning that in the large N limit, there's no black hole saddle points in, in gravity. Beyond certain temperature, there turns out to emerge two branches of black holes. The left one I call small black holes, because at given temperature, its mass is smaller. Uh, it's radius also. Uh, there's another branch called large black hole because it's larger, I mean literally. The physics of small black hole is more or less similar to those black holes in, small, uh, in flat space because its size is sort of smaller than the characteristic radius scale of antidistance space. It sort of behaves similarly to the black holes in flat space. Okay? And it has the characteristic feature that, of having a negative specific heat. You increase the temperature, mass decreases, so thermodynamically, it's locally unstable, uh, if you consider it in the canon equinox angle. The large black hole has positive specific heat, and it will turn out to play very important roles in ADS thermodynamics in the canon equinox angle. It plays very important role in understanding what is called the Hawking page phase transition in an anti-distance phase time, which is the following. So to understand the true nature of the thermodynamics of this ADS phase, or grav quantum gravity in ADS phase, in the large end limit, or in, in the limit where the Newton constant uh, in suitable units tend to be small, you, you'll have to understand all possible local saddle points which can have chance to be dominant in the large end limit. Okay? So there are two apparent saddle points which can compete with each other. One is the large black hole that I explained. One is called the gas of thermal gravitons in anti-distance space. So the, so, the, so the latter one, is that you start from antidistance space, you can have metric, and you, you may have some other fields. You may be ADS5 times S5, it may be complicated. But all, along this ADS vacuum, you consider the small fluctuations of fields and consider the quadratic expansions of them and obtain a weakly interacting graviton, this particle spectrum. Okay? And you give, put them on a finite temperature, and it turns out that the free energy of this graviton, gas of graviton, will be at the zeroth power of n, because it really doesn't see the Newton constant. Okay. If you truncate this to the quadratic level, it has no way to see the Newton constant. So the first saddle point has a characteristic that the free energy is zeroth power in n, and if you consider the free energy divided by n squared in the larger limit, it's approximately zero. 
The second phase, the, high, the second phase, the, the saddle point, is given by the large ADS black hole, and it sees Newton constant or n square everywhere. Okay? So it's free energy, if you can compute it carefully, is proportional to n square, and the two phases compete, and the dominant one will be the one with lower free energy. It turns out that at the lower temperature, below critical temperature, the gas of gravitons dominate, while beyond certain temperature, which we call the Hawking page transition temperature, the large black holes dominate by its having its free energy negative. So this is one important feature you have to have in mind all the time in ADS. After the discovery of ADS-CFT, the gauge theory dual interpretation of Hawking page transition has been immediately suggested, I think by Witten, and you are, you're forced to study the quantum field theory living on the boundary, which is sphere times r. So we call it the radially quantized quantum conformal field theory. There's a canonical way of putting conformal field theory on a manifold taking the form of sphere times a temporal line. And on this quantum field theory, what has been supposed to be the dual of confinement of the, of the Hawking page transition is the confinement deconfinement transition, which claims that, which says that in the low temperature, at low temperature, the free energy of the gauge theory should be scaling like n to the zeroth power. And so it, 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 it's, it's called the confining phase. So it gets contribution. One can understand that it gets contribution from gauge invariant combinations of all these uh, uh, gauge theory fields, like blue balls, mesons, and so on. So it doesn't really have a chance to see n directly. If you increase the temperature, it's supposed to be in the deconfined phase. And the free energy is supposed to be a square of n. Basically, it essentially sees the liberated gluons and all the matrix degrees of freedom. So the basic picture developed by ADSFT is that the phase of black holes after the Hawking phase transition is uh, supposed to be the deconfined quark gluon plasma. And this kind of picture has been studied gradually more quantitatively. Something like 15 years ago, these authors have studied the thermodynamics of Young Mill's theory of various sorts on S3 times R. But due to technical difficulty, you know, these kind of gravitational phenomena are supposed to be emergent in the strong coupling limit of the conformal field theory. But the easier setting to study is, of course, the weak coupling. So despite this strong and weak coupling difference, these authors studied the possible larger phases of this gauge theory, weakly coupled gauge theory on this manifold and found some surprisingly qualitative features to the ADS gravitational physics. For instance, you can already see some phase transition, reminiscent of Hawking phase, phase transition. So some qualitative physics at weak coupling seems to be agreeing with the strong coupling black hole features quite well. However, not surprisingly, other qualitative features and probably basically all quantitative aspects are different between this weak coupling calculus and the strong coupling gravitational uh, the, the physics. So the natural question one can ask, as I said, to make a more quantitative pro progress is to be a bit modest and study a special kind of black holes in NDS times S5, preserving certain amount of supersymmetry. Okay? So, so since ADS5 times S5 is the maximally supersymmetric case, uh, uh, you're supposed to study the four-dimensional maximal super young theory on this boundary manifold. From the gravitational side, finding BPS black holes in ADS-5 times S5, a regular black hole solution, turns out to be surprisingly difficult and technical. But thankfully to the heroic works of Bukowski, Real, and other, other uh, GR people, about 15 years ago, these, flip, these BPS black hole solutions in ADS-5 times S5 have been found. So the important question is whether one can understand it from the dual young Mills theory, hopefully using some power of supersymmetry. And very surprisingly, this is always a basic kind of question in this gauge gravity duality. For some reason, uh, this basic question hasn't been answered very well till very recently, late last year. And I'll show you today and tomorrow that the basic uh, solution to this question turns out to be extremely simple, at least in the simple setting in which you can use a higher dimensional version of the Cardi formula of quantum field theory on this manifold. So this is the question I'd like to explain. Uh, any other questions so far? Please interrupt me if you think I'm too fast. I tried my best to reduce the material, at least for the first lecture. Let's see. So, so uh, yeah. when you equality the black hole, yeah. each black hole will refer to a small or a large 
large. I'm always referring, I mean, all, if the canonical ensemble is meaningless, it's specific, it is negative, it's locally unstable. Yeah. I mean, I always consider the system with positive, specific heat, positive susceptibility, and so on. In canonical or grand canonical ensemble. It makes meaning in micro canonical ensemble, but I, I won't do that. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? ADS5 black hole and the ADS5. Uh, that's asymptotically flat black hole. Five oh, dimensional asymptotically flat. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's related to some ADS black holes, but near horizon ADS3. So depending on which black objects you consider, you have to shift descriptions if you really want to use ADS CFT to understand those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the supersymmetric black holes are surprisingly complicated. It's not, not like a Schwarzschild that I just explained to you in one slide. I won't even bother you to see the exact solutions. Uh, I want you not to see the solutions because from field theory, this complicated object can be explained rather simply. Okay? Um, I can explain to you why these solutions are complicated and I'll give you just some salient aspects of them. So the BPS black hole solutions in, in ADS5 times S5 can carry the following charges. Of course, it can carry energy. It can carry various angular momentum. It has ADS5, which has three sphere transverse part, so it can have two angular momentum in SO4, which I call J1 and J2. So I call this angular momentum. And it can also have internal momentum charge on S5 part. So it has SO6 symmetry, so it has three cartons. I denote these carton charges Q1, Q2, Q3. Sometimes I'll call them internal charges, sometimes I'll call them electric charges from the point of view of ADS5, okay, this internal direction. But the properties of supersymmetric objects is that their energy is related to other charges by characteristic relation, which we call BPS conditions. And in the case of ADS5 times S5, the BPS energy multiplied by the radius of ADS is just a simple linear combination of all five charges. It turns out that the simplify setting in which you turn, on, turn off either angular momentum or internal charge, uh, if you do that, you don't get black hole. For instance, if you try to consider zero angular momentum and consider only internal or electric charges, this sector is completely solved from field theory. And we know from field theory that there are not enough microscopic states to form black holes. Okay? So you have to turn on angular momentum, making the story complicated. If you turn just that on angular momentum and turn, on, turn off internal charges, then there are also some arguments that there are not enough BPS states. Actually, the spectrum of BPS operators in this sector is surprisingly poor, poor. almost nothing. So they all get anomalous dimensions in interactive theory. So basically, you have to turn on many non-zero charges to form regular supersymmetric black holes, which you can try to understand from field theory. Since you have to turn on many charges, it breaks lots of symmetries. It's not like Schwarzschild black hole. So it only turns out to preserve, generically, two of the 32 supercharges. Okay? So the states in the dual field theory corresponding to their microstate are supposed to be 1 16th BPS states. Funny, yeah. So the solutions are necessarily very complicated. And to find these solutions, very detailed supersymmetry structures like G structures and so on had to be applied, which was the really high tech techniques at that moment. Right? So these are the rough structure of solutions, no, no more than this you have to understand. But I like to emphasize just one technical aspect, which will turn out to be important later. It's not physically that important, I think. So many properties of supersymmetric black holes are summarized as follows. So they, I said that they have five independent charges, so Q1, Q2, Q3, J1, J2, which from microscopic viewpoint, much more independent, right? Energy is given by charges, so it's not independent. So naively, you might expect five parameter solution carrying five different charges. But in all kinds of supersymmetric black hole business, for certain technical reasons, one always finds solutions with one less independent parameter than the number of charges you expect. That's a technical property of solution, and it has to do with uh, some smooth event horizon properties with supersymmetry of black holes. It's, but it's quite robustly developed property. 
So one technical property you'll have to remember, which will turn out to be important later, is that supersymmetric black holes have charges with one less independent parameter, at least the known ones. So they are satisfying some relations between these charges. So the five charges satisfy one complicated relation, which I'll explain to you later. And similar features are existing in a simplified version for a simple split back black hole. Very recently, a much more dirtier black hole solutions have been found in ADL5 times S5, trying to better understand this property. And there have been some numerical studies about uh, constructing supersymmetric black holes in ADS5 times S5 with some charge condensate or angular momentum condensate outside the black hole horizon. So we call these hairy black holes. These enjoy the property that they have no charge relations uh, and they are very dirty from the point of view of gravity. So we have non hairy black holes satisfying this property and more dirtier hairy black holes, uh, which are not well developed yet from the gravity side, but probably from the quantum field theory perspective, we can explore these objects. I'll explain something about these in the next tomorrow's lecture. So this is all I want you to just remember about supersymmetric black holes in ADS5 and S5. I'll turn to the field theory side, which turns out to be simple. Okay. So we want to study the degeneracy of the BPS local operators, preserving same two Hermitian supercharges, or equivalently BPS states propagating on S3 times R. Of course, it's still difficult to, to study these BPS states directly at strong coupling. So I want to more easily study a Witten index type partition function on S3 times R, or the Euclidean partition function on S3 times S1, turning on certain chemical, temperature-like chemical potential. But I'm going to study this by not counting the full set of bosonic states plus fermionic states, but by inserting minus 1 to the fermion number. And if you suitably restrict chemical potential, it enjoys the property that it's not it's independent of the continuous coupling parameters of the theory. So you can easily compute it from the free theory and trust that the index has the same expression all the way to strong coupling, where black holes are supposed to exist. So this kind of index has been defined and studied uh, 14 years ago by now by these authors. They are formally given by the trace over the Hilbert space of this quantum field theory with minus one to the fermion number, counting the number of bosonic states, minus the number of fermionic states. So if you are unlucky, you're always having the risk of losing certain states by both Fermi cancellations. Okay. But this is all, all we can do okay, from weakly coupled field theory techniques. So that's one minus one to the F. And you weight the states by uh, various chemical potentials conjugate to the electric charges and angular momentum that I explained. To make this measure commute with supersymmetry, two supersymmetry that I mentioned, I should restrict these five chemical potentials to obey this relation. Because one of the supercharged themselves are rotating under the spatial rotation and internal rotation because they have R charges and spin quantum number. So if the weight is rotating the, all the supercharges, it fails to be an index. So the particular combination of this acting on the two supercharges with which I'm going to define my index has to be suppressed to zero in order to define an, an index. So it counts states with five independent charges, but with four independent chemical potential. That's the kind of index uh, these people have uh, developed. Sometimes we call it the super conformal index to distinguish it from the more commonly studied uh, indices of quantum mechanics. And this quantity is sort of guaranteed to be independent of the coupling constant. So you can just compute it from free theory, weakly coupled gauge theory. Let's say for UN, n equal for super young mills theory. These authors have immediately computed this. And, and it's technically complicated expression, but the philosophy of physics is very simple. It takes the exponential of summation of n1 to infinity with 1 over n times certain function. But the basic point is that the function appearing in this exponent is the index traced over uh, single fields or single particles. We call a single particle partition function or letter partition function. So once you understand the partition function of the free field theory over a single particle, you can form what is called the platistic exponential or the multi-particle exponential, just imposing both Fermi identical particle stat statistics and you can form the multi-particle partition function out of this single letter field partition function. Once you do that, there's a projection given by this unitary matrix integral with n eigenvalues alpha being periodic. This basically plays the role of projecting the multi-particle spectrum to gauge singlets, because you're doing a gauge theory. 
So this is the free theory partition function, which we can trust all the way to through our coupling. So the question is following. Uh, well, you don't have to really remember the details. You just remember the basic ideas of all the expressions I just told you. That would be enough to understand, hopefully, uh, the remaining part of my lectures. The basic two questions that people wanted to understand about this quantity is that does the low temperature or the, or the, or the large chemical potential limit of the index agree with that of the BPS gravitons on ADS5 times S5, characteristic of the confining phase? And the second question, if the first question is answered successfully, is whether this index undergoes a deconfinement transition or a hawking pace transition at, at certain finite values of chemical potential. These are the two questions we'd like to understand better today and tomorrow. Another question? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's quite unclear. I mean, one combination of these four can be regarded as temperature. Others are extra refinement parameters like, uh, like yeah, but, but um, um, you know, you know the basically, these quantities are each uh, conjugate to positive charges or positive angular momentum, and each of them contributes to the BPS energy. So all these four parameters are sharing the role of temperatures. In the most simplified setting, you can set these to be all equal, these to be all equal, and then due to this relation, you, remember, you get just one parameter. Okay? And that unique parameter is the natural temperature. Yes, yes. In most simple sense, the examples I'll mostly illustrate to you is, um, let's say, um, I mean, the role of temperature is, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the simplest answer I can give is that the four parameters are sharing the role of temperature. And in various limits where I, I take certain charges to be large or where, 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 where I unrefine chemical potential, different combinations of parameters will play a natural role of temperature. It depends on various limits. For instance, if you consider large black holes at large charges, uh, the average of these two omegas conjugate to angular momentum, they will play the natural role of temperature. You know, you know, in the Cardi formula, we have tau, which is the inverse of temperature. The average of this will play the role of that in my Cardi formula. Okay. Hello, excuse me, I have a question. So this expression reminds where, 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 where are you? Sorry, sir. Oh, yes. Sir, yeah. Yeah. So this expression reminds me a lot of, uh, it resembles the twisted indices that you get in the literature, the topologically twisted indices. Sorry, re reminds me of you of what? Uh, the topologically twisted indices. So these topologically are twisted indices. Topologically twisted indices are giving some background flux on spatial manifolds. That's right. Yeah. And my understanding is that it's basically counting macroscopic number of ground states. Okay. Here you have unique ground state, you're counting excitations. Right. Yeah, right. so that's a difference. But some at superficial level, formulas might look similar. Similar, yeah. yeah so, but, but physics is quite different. And these alpha A's that you have for, in the measure, these are essentially the cartons? Essentially what? The cartons of the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So, so the unitary matrix can be diagonalized, yeah, and all the eigenvalues are phases. So, so these are the angle variables, that's the right. eigenvalues. So, okay. Okay, yeah. and, so these and, are all periodic variables. And exactly, so if one is interested, say, in, in some sort of ADS CFT, so you have to have some notion of strong coupling, right? Yes. So in this expression, where does the coupling feature? It doesn't appear. It's an index. That's right. Oh, okay. You can believe it all the way to strong coupling. Okay. And the, and the strong, at least for certain class of BPS black holes called BPS black holes, this coupling independent expression should be encoding the information of these black holes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. So to answer these kind of questions, this author has employed a particular large end approximation calculation technique, which I mentioned here not because I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it today, but I'll use it critically for tomorrow. And I also want to explain what was the standpoint of uh, studies uh, 15 years ago, based on which we try to improve the situation. Okay. So I explained to you that this is an integration of n eigenvalue variables of a unitary matrix. It's basically a gauge holonomy variables along a temporal circle. So it's rank n, so you have n of them. But you can really regard them as the periodic variable, n periodic variable, as the coordinates of n identical particles living on a circle. Okay? So in the larger n limit, you have larger n number of identical particles. And you can think of replacing this n larger n number of integrals into 
uh, the functional integration over the distribution of this large n number of particles. So this is a coordinate of a periodic variable on which these holonomy variables are living. And these functions are constrained by this mild positivity constraint. So it's a probability-like object. Alternatively, you can uh, free expand this function and consider the functional integration of these free modes. Okay? So just by staring at this expression a little bit and using some standard large n techniques, you can replace this in the large n limit by the following functional integral where the measure of the integral is taking the form of Gaussian exponent around uniform distribution, uniform distribution. And the expression here is nothing but the partition function I've, I've shown here. You can ma massage this, expre this expression, this, this second expression, to obtain these kinds of coefficients of the Gaussian integral. Okay? So in the larger limit, the integral looks very, very sim simple, apparently. So if these coefficients are all positive, is this large n number out here, so that you can carry out a large n uh, approximate calculation of this index by just doing the Gaussian integral calculation around all the fluctuations around uniform eigenvalue distribution being zero. Okay. So at low temperature, you do this kind, of, it turns out that it's one minus fugacity, so at low enough temperature, deltas and omegas are large, so that this coefficient is guaranteed to be positive. So you can do this simplest Gaussian integration at rho equals to zero, and your saddle point is the uniform distribution of larger number of eigenvalues. And the result that you get is a, nothing but a result of Gaussian integral. So had the expectation value of rows been non-zero, it would directly give you the semi-classical free energy proportional to n square. But since all of them are zero at low temperature, all you get is the determinant factor, which is independent of n, actually. So therefore, you very easily get the confining phase spectrum. And this completely agrees with the supergraviton index on ADS5 times S5. That's what had been developed by these authors 14 years ago. So the question one has the answer yes. At low temperature, the index agrees with graviton. At high temperature, the puzzle comes in. You stare at the expression of the index. It turns out that in the physical primitive regimes for delta and omega, they always have to be positive in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in this real part. It turns out that this coefficient is always positive, no matter how small the chemical potentials are, no matter how high the temperature-like variables are. So it turns out that if you stick to this expression, larger expression, you never get non-trivial condensation of these rows in the saddle points. Then there's no hope that you can see a free energy of proportional to n square. Apparently, this seems to imply that the index never sees the confinement phase transition and the black hole phase. And the, the, the large n index always seems to be the pro inverse product of this function, agreeing with the graviton index. So the conclusion more than 10 years ago was the index never seemed to see the confinement. Okay? And it's very uh, 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 heuristic. I mean, it can be very, very well understood because the condensation of these variables is really a characteristic feature of the confinement, because uh, some coefficient here, appearing here, is given an interpretation of Polyakov loop. It's something like Wilson loop, but it's wrapping on a temporal circle at finite temperature. So this quantity being non-zero is a characteristic feature of the deconfined phase. Okay? So since these are all zero in this larger set of point calculus, we naturally, uh, alternatively reconfirm that this is only exhibiting confining phase of the, the, the gate, gate theory. But there's one caveat. I mean, people try to understand this as follows. They try to understand this as a result of severe boson fermion cancellation, so that even though the true BPS states may show fast exponential growth of degeneracy, exponential of n squared or something, it's always subject to boson fermion cancellation, so that the remaining states surviving this cancellation might, in principle, show much less growth, much, much slower growth of uh, macroscopic entropy. So it might be the technical reason why not the index not seeing this uh, deconfined phase or the dual black hole. So that was one scenario people were thinking about. But there's a caveat of this argument. All calculations are done at real fugacities, and trying to generalize it to complex fugacity, I suggest is the solution. And, and after doing that, I'm going to claim that this index is going to see deconfinement and also black holes. 
Anyway, I hope this point is clear, that the index is counting boson minus fermions, so that in, in principle can undergo some cancellation, showing less interesting growth of uh, entropies. Okay? By this, I think most people imagine what I like to call microscopic cancellation. So by this, I mean the follow. So you expand the given partition function. It ca carries lots of fugacities, but it's a schematic expression. It carries four fugacities, but let's say it's collectively say it's x, and it has independent charges. I collectively call it j. To see the spectrum, you make the expansion of this partition function in fugacity, and at given charge order, you read off the integer coefficient. Log of this is going to be the entropy. Okay? So if each coefficient at macroscopic charge, proportional to n square, is exhibiting boring zeroth power of uh, 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 entropy, this will really mean a severe Bose Fermi cancellation. And this, if this is the case, there will be no hope in using index to see a macroscopic entropy responsible for the black hole, which should scale like n square. Okay. I think this was what people mostly imagined by Bose Fermi cancellation. I'd like to assert that there seems to be a much weaker and subtler notion of Bose Fermi cancellation, which I'd like to call macroscopic cancellation. I'd like to illustrate this more concretely, but uh, unfortunately, in the larger N index, it's hard to illustrate. So for the technical limitation I have, I'm going to illustrate what might be happening uh, by expanding the index in the U2, U2 maximal superannuals theory. And to illustrate it more simply, as I explained to you, I'm, I'm going to only keep one chemical potential parameter, which I'd like to interpret as the fugacity for temperature. So I take all three electric charges to be equal and all two angular momentum to be equal. And then there's basically one fugacity factor, which is e to the minus 1 over t appearing in the index, the temperature-like parameter appearing in the index. And you expand this, let's say, u2 partition form. I mean, it would have been much better if you can do un, but for the illustration purpose, let me do u2. You expand it to a fairly high number of charges. The starting number one is the vacuum on S3 times R, and these are excited states and higher energy states you go on, going on. What you find is that the number itself grows. I uh, haven't precisely measured how fast, but it definitely grows to a certain extent. But with randomly oscillating signs, it's not even plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus. I don't see any pattern here. But any, anyway, if you take these charges to be macroscopic, in certain, let's say much larger than one or something, certainly you'll be getting quite large degeneracy, but with randomly oscillating signs. And think about what you do when you try to extract out the coefficient, the macroscopic entropy, by using saddle point approximation, either at large charge or large n or whatsoever. So at large charge, you're going to do the saddle point approximation of the so-called inverse Laplace transformation. Picking out a characteristic coefficient will be making an inverse Laplace transformation of the partition function. Right? It projects to a particular coefficient. But at macroscopic charges j, we carry out this calculation by a saddle point approximation, relying on large charge or large n or both. Okay? And this saddle point calculation at macroscopic charge is really insensitive to changing this quanta, changing these charges by a basic quantum unit, which are all half integers, basically. You know, they're all momentum, angular momentum in ADS and S. So it, it's quantized quantity. But macroscopic calculation, Legendre transformation, is completely insensitive to that nature as far as I can see. So it will really be insensitive to whether I'm counting this order, this order, this order. So the natural thing you can explain back with wild sign oscillation is that this kind of saddle point approximation should be counting some smeared out, <coughs> smeared out contributions of nearby degeneracies. This is my assertion. Okay? But having this picture in mind, what you can try to do is to insert phases of fugacities and improve this wild oscillation as best as you can. Because plus and minus signs are special cases of phases. And if you have fugacities you can, which you can complexify, you see for saddle points with complexified fugacities. Okay? So you, you, you care about large charges. You care about, you'll be wanting to take this x to be close to 1 because it's a tight temperature limit. But with judiciously tuned phase factors for fugacities, to maximally obstruct this macroscopic cancellations or smearing out. By doing that, I claim that you can really see black holes from the index in the larger limit or in the large charge limit. 
And that will allow you to see the black hole from the index. That's my essential claim. Is this point clear? You can ask questions about this point any point you want because that's my simple claim. And I'm going to show you in the remaining time that it really works. So tomorrow I really explain, equipped with this complex figuristic picture, that the index really sees the confinement transition of the sort I explained in the previous slide. Today I'm going to do something simpler in the 20 minutes of time that I have. I'm going to study the high temperature limit. Okay? This is a kind of a higher dimensional version of the Cardi limit in which you take the, the chemical, chemi temperature-like variables, conjugate to momentum large first, right? And then you take central charge large, or n squared to be large, but, but the original philosophy of Strom and Javapa was to consider large charge or high temperature limit, exhibiting high Cardi-like formula, and counting certain simple black holes. So even though large n should be taken at a certain stage, I'm gonna study the high temperature limit first and count large black holes first with large charges. That turns out to be the simplest possible problem in this sector. And completely following the spirit of Strom and Javapa in 1996, using the two-dimensional Cardi formula. So the analogous limit that you should consider is the large spin limit. Note that there are two chemical potentials conjugate to angular momentum, and I'm taking that two chemical potentials to be much smaller than one. Okay. In principle, you can insert some finite phase to that, but I'm not going to take advantage of this. I'm going to take these complex chemical potentials much smaller than one. This is a higher dimensional analog of tau being much smaller than one. And these kinds of limits have actually been studied in the literature, like D. Pietro Komagoski in 2014. It has been improved by Adehali and some other studies. But they all missed the possibility of complexifying the fugastic. So they also suffer from severe Bose Fermi cancellation. For instance, in some studies made by these authors, for four dimensional n equal one superconformal field theories, the free energy is pro inversely proportional to some temperature like variables, like omega one, omega two. And the coefficient is A central charge minus C central charge. And in the case of large N gauge theories with gravity all, both leading behavior is proportional to N square, but difference is subleading. Why they count subleading? Because they didn't do a judicial, made a judicious use of complex frequency to obstruct both Fermi cancellation. Okay? Actually, for N equal four Young Mill theory, this is exactly zero, making this their analysis quite boring. What I'm going to show you today is that simply generalizing these kinds of analysis by taking advantage of complex chemical potential to obstruct, maximally obstruct boson fermion cancellation, you get an amazingly different structure. And you see the black hole. Question so far. This is the essence of my claim in today's lecture. The rest will be a little bit of technical elaboration. The next two pages will be all the technical parts. It's amazingly simple in my eyes, and hope some of you can catch the essence in, on, at real time. It's, it's extremely low tech, considering all these supersymmetric localization and stuff. Compared to that, this is nothing, okay? But anyway, uh, to do this, let me just do one more technical change of convention. It, the index was given by minus one to the F, trace of minus one to the F, with some chemical potential satisfying this relation to make this guarantee that this expression is indexed. I changed the convention so that I don't insert minus one to the F explicitly here, okay? But instead, minus one to the F is the exponential of some phases depending on certain charges, okay? So this phase can be distributed equally to these deltas and omegas. So instead of eliminating minus one to the F explicitly in the trace, you, you slightly modify the relation between this chemical potential from zero to two pi i. So this quantity will be rotating the supercharges in question so as to guarantee the effect of minus one to the F. So apparently it seems that you're computing an ordinary partition function without minus one to the F, but the different relation between charge chemical potentials guarantee that it's the same quantity. It's just a technical setting which allows you to visualize the physics more transparently. Personally, this change of convention was what I didn't understand to the last moment of my project, and just understanding that, everything became clear to me. Okay. So this is much better notation of understanding the index. So if you change this convention, the previous matrix integral expression slightly changes a bit. It's, it's, it's basically the same quantity, but the matrix integral expression slightly changes a bit. 
And I want to do an approximation of this, approximate calculation of this unitary matrix integral when the two chemical potential for the spin on S3 are large, are small, corresponding to large spin limit. So that to, to be very rigorous, you can do, treat this infinite sum very carefully. But the rough thing you have to do is to approximate this cinch of some functions into the function itself, okay? since omega 1 and omega 2 are small. Okay? And then the characteristic behavior of the integral, this exponential of omega 1, omega 2, appearing in the denominator. And the remaining sum is 1 over n times 1 over n times 1 over n, so 1 over n cubed, multiplied by some monomial terms in the denominator. So there are a finite number of terms in the denominator. And each time in the numerator, so each time in the numerator gives an infinite series of this form, which is trilogarithm function. And all these steps can be done much more carefully and rigorously. But all you get by taking this Cardi-like limit is the linear combination of trilogarithm functions with chemical potentials and gauge fugacities with one of, one of omega and omega 2 behavior in front. Okay. The important part here is that uh, these are taken to be small, so the internal electric charges chemical potential have, are sharing the finite imaginary part to pi i. Okay? So uh, in the previous studies, uh, all chemical potentials kept real, so if these are going to be small, this is going to be small as well. Right? So all chemical potential simultaneously going down to zero is the high temperature limit. That's still true here for the real part. If, the real, if this is kept small, the real part of these are always small, right? So these always have small real parts, but the imaginary parts can have order one, finite part, even at high temperature limit. And that finite phase should be maximally taken advantage of to obstruct force forming cancellation. Only after you keep this finite imaginary part, you find the right Cardi saddle point, which corresponds to black holes. Otherwise, you miss that and you get the previous following formula. Anyway, having in mind that these imaginary parts are order one and finite, even at high temperature, you get this expression. And the remaining question is that with this large exponent coefficient in the Cardi limit, how do you carry out this larger number of integrations? Okay? So since this number is very large, relying on this Cardi large charge behavior, you can find out some saddle points for this gauge holonomies. It turns out that the holonomies in this maximal Young is extremely simple. It turns out to be the case in which the saddle point turns out to be that all the end gauge holonomies are on top of each other. All the identical particles on, on the unit circles are on top of each other. This is the point at which you can make the Polyakov loop expectation value largest. So it's, I call it maximally decomfining saddle point. So plug that in to the previous formula. The integration is gone, and the gauge holonomy measure is all one, because alpha i minus alpha b is always zero. And the expression you get is extremely simple for free energy. Finally, using some identity between, between this, uh, of these trilogarithmic functions, you get the following simple algebraic equation. The, basically, the difference of two trilog functions, in particular range of imaginary parameters, is related to the Bernoulli polynomial of, of a third, a third Bernoulli polynomial, which is a cubic polynomial. So you get the simple Cardi limit of the free energy given by a simple, uh, what, is, what do you call it, this, this algebraic expression, the rational function. And note that I've taken this temp inverse temperature-like variable corresponding to the angular momentum to be small. So it's, ma it's very large in, in the sense that omega 1, omega 2 is small. It's also macroscopic and large in that n square is in front. Note that contrary to the previous studies, I've allowed and, and forced these internal charges chemical potential to have finite order 1 imaginary parts. So this free energy is really macroscopic proportional to n square times finite number. So allowing this phase, you really find some macroscopic free energy. In the next slide, by making a Legendre transformation to micro Legendre transformation at given charges, you will find also a macroscopic positive entropy proportional to n squared, and that will correspond to large black holes. So it's simple, right? Amazingly simple. Because it was so simple, I was hesitating for a long while whether I'm correct or I'm stupidly making a mistake, but I think it's right, and it's very simple at least in the large black limit, as simple as the two-dimensional Cardi formula counting. Good. I have to note that two months after our works, Benini and Paolo Milan have carried out an analysis relying on large N only and find, found that this kind of free energy 
continues to be true at certain larger and sadder point. In canonical ensemble or grand canonical ensemble, they may fail to be the dominant sadder point, but at least this expression is shown to be, I believe it's shown to be true at certain local sadder points at the larger limit. Okay, that will also have some interesting implications. It's a so simple expression. Actually, the numerator of this expression turns out to be the cubic polynomial, and we call this an anomaly polynomial of the four-dimensional gauge theory. If you replace four-dimensional n equal four Young Mills theory by other four-dimensional n equal one conformal field theory, I haven't went through the details, but I'm sure that the numerator will be changed by the anomaly polynomial of such theories. By anomaly, I mean the proofed anomalies of global symmetries existing in this theory, like R symmetry, internal symmetry. It's given by cubic polynomial. So it has been observed by this that this quantity is closely related to tooth anomaly of four-dimensional gauge theory. Tomorrow I'll give an alternative derivation of this Cardi entropy, purely using effective action techniques at high temperature and using tooth anomaly information. So this also has a very beautiful de intrinsic derivation. Uh, almost non-Lagrangian so that you can generalize it to more challenging quantum field theories in four dimensions, six dimensions, even dimensions. Good. Questions so far? Uh, 10 minutes to oh. until 12, 20, 13, okay, good. Good, good, good. So all you have to do is to make, to see the physics of black holes, is to make a Lejeune transformation, inverse Laplace, Laplace transformation to, at given charges, okay? And I, I'd like to see if the, I get macroscopic uh, entropy proportional to n square, and whether that is really agreeing with the uh, Beckenstein Hawking entropy of given known black holes in ADS virus, that's why. So, so, to compute the macroscopic entropy, you, you do the inverse Laplace transformation to pick out a coefficient, but at the large charge approximation, you have to do a Lagrangian transformation. So, you take the minus of the free energy, the exponential of this is basically the partition function, and you insert this factor and extremize with. Uh, uh, chemical potential at given charges. Okay. So you basically extremize this, and one of the saddle points is hopefully supposed to be corresponding to black holes uh, uh, if the index is really capturing it. Okay. So you extremize this kind of function at given charges, uh, where the chemical potential is satisfying this constraint for the index. And although we call this entropy function very often, and although all these expressions are appearing to have real coefficients, the saddle points after extremization generally have complex S's, basically because this chemical potential is satisfying the constraint for the index, which is complex. So you can set these quantities to be 2 pi i mod shift of 4 pi i's. Okay. At certain chamber, you can do this kind of constraint. So generally, the entropy extremized value will be complex. And it's natural to expect that in a sense, because, you know, if you're going to add up all these states, for instance, without imaginary part of chemical potential, what you're going to do is following. So this is the space of mac, mac, uh, total number of accessible states. If you just count index with real fugacities, once these small vectors are all unit vectors to visualize what I'm going to say. So if you just have bosonic states with real fugacities, it will get plus one contribution to this direction. If one has fermions, it will get minus one contribution to this direction, and they all compete and cancel, and the remaining thing number you'll get will be somewhere around here. And they, the situation is that along this real fugacity situation, the cancellation is severe. What we're hoping to do is to introduce finite phases of fugacity to rotate all these bosonic and fermionic unit factors to maximally try to obstruct cancellations. I have no idea what will be happening state by state, but the schematic possibilities are the following. You rotate each state by the charges that we have, by chemi finite chemical potential, and it might develop certain partial cancellation, but you try best to obstruct the cancellation. And the imaginary part that you may obtain after this uh, extremization might be a remnant of this phased rotation that you made for each individual unit vector or states. So there might be certain imaginary part or phase part remaining. I decide mostly not to care about that on physical grounds. And the real part of S, or the exponential of the real part of S, can be interpreted as providing a lower bound of the BPS degeneracy, because adding all these unit vectors length will be the true, true generic degeneracy. This will be setting a lower bound given by the index on the truth entropy. Okay? 
you know, if you do the index, there's always a possibility that you count less than the true entropy, but you try our best. Okay? So the basic intrinsic strategy in quantum field theory is to dismiss this part and try to see how the index can give a lower bound of the true entropy. And if it turns out that for certain charge configuration, if this saturates the known Bekenstein of Kinyan entropy of black hole, then we can claim that we counted such black holes from the index. That's always a strategy when you use an index. Okay. Is this point clear? However, note that I emphasize to you, necessarily emphasize to you one technical property of these black holes. The known black holes, the analytic solutions, have five charges, but they satisfy a charge relation. So apparently it's a very technical relation. From the bulk side, there's an explanation why there should be a charge relation from nice behavior of new horizons and so on. But from intrinsically proven quantum field theory, that's the only black hole we know of. So what, when we want to count known black holes, we restrict the charges of our free quantum field theory analysis to the configurations ch satisfying charge relations. Okay? And it turns out that, amazingly to me, there's some bulk explanation, but from intrinsical, intrinsic field theory's point of view, it's quite amazing to me that the complicated charge relations of these BPS black holes turn out to coincide with the imaginary part of the extremized complex entropy being zero. It just turns out to be the case. So just plugging that in first and doing some saddle point equations in, in chemical potential, the extremized entropy can be shown generally complex, can be shown to satisfy this QD equation, just a technical fact. But once we know that the charge relation is given by this, you can try to solve this with real S. And that demands you two algebraic equations. The real part is this, the imaginary part of this equation is this. You solve this, you get two independent expressions for the macroscopic entropy. Indeed, it's macroscopic. If all the charges are of n-square, the entropy is of n-square. So they should correspond to black hole. And the compatibility of the two expressions at this gives you the charge relation. You can consistently check that this equaling to this is imaginary part equal to zero. So you get the charge relation uh, corresponding to the known black holes. And the resulting entropy has been shown long ago by myself and Professor Kim Young Lee is the right expression for the Bekenstein black hooking entropy for known ages by black holes. So this establishes the fact that index is seeing quantitatively the black holes. Our calculation is valid for large black holes. But the, yeah, so, so strictly speaking, our field theory has been used, the index has been used to count black holes when these charges are scaling like n square plus an n independent constant, which you also take to be large. So this is a higher dimensional version of a Cardi-like limit that I take, and I count these black holes very, very simply. As you see, I mean, you might have missed some technical details, but there's nothing deep here. It's all cheap. All you have to know is try log function, nothing more. Any questions? Good. Uh, it turns out that we derive this free energy only in the hard limit when omega 1 and omega 2 is 0. But extremization of this quantity and explaining the black hole uh, entropy and also chemical potential, it turns out that this kinds of extremization problem explains black holes even away from the Cardi limit, when J is not much larger than other charges. Okay. That turns out to be the fact. And that means that even away from the large black hole limit or Cardi limit, this turns out to describe the, the known black holes even in case it fails to be the dominant saddle point. No matter whether it's the dominant saddle point or not, this free energy describes certain larger and saddle points in ADS5 and S5. That turns out to be the fact, and it has been, oh, sorry, I that space is cited. It has been established prior to our work uh, two years ago by Zaffaroni, Husseini, and Hristov. Okay. So in the remaining part of my lecture, I'll be studying this partition function even away from the Cardi limit just to, as a property of the known ADS5 times S5 black hole solutions. Okay. If you just evaluate this and, and plug in the extremal part and take the real part of it, this is the free energy of the black hole. Okay. And you can plot these free energies in temperature-like variables to see what could be the possible fate of these large end black hole saddle points away from the Cardi limit. We sort of show that this should be the dominant saddle point in the Grand Canary Ground Ensemble at large charges, 
but it's unclear what the situation is when the charges are not large if you go away from cardio limit. Okay? It's just a local set of point of gravity. So to simply explain the setting, I, I, I again stick to my unrefined version where I take all electric charges equal and all angular momentum to be pairwise equal. Okay? So the only remaining chemical potential is what I call omega. Omega is playing the role of inverse temperature. And this is conjugate to a particular combination of electric charge and angular momentum, which roughly plays the role of energy in the index, qualitatively. So you extremize this expression, and you can plot the relation between various thermodynamic quantities. You plot the energy-like quantity and temperature-like quantity. It shows a feature amazingly similar to the Schwarzschild black hole okay, in the index version. Okay. Note that these black holes are way much, co much more complicated than Schwarzschild black hole, but it sh shares a similar picture. Temperature-like variables in, in the index. Below a critical value, there's no black hole set point. Above that, there appears two branches. The left of branches has uh, negative specific heat or susceptibility, so it's unstable in grand canon ensemble. You have large black hole branch, which would be the dominant, which would be the relevant one when considering uh, grand canonical thermodynamics. And then you plot the free energy divided by n squared as a function of temperature-like variables. Small black hole we dismiss. Large black hole, we care about the sign of the free energy. If it's positive, it loses against thermal gravitons. If it's negative, it becomes more dominant at the point, causing Hawking page transition, if this is the only black hole. Okay. It turns out that there's a transition slightly after the nucleation point of local set point, somewhere here, when free energy divided over n squared becomes zero. So had this been the, had, had the analytic solution known in the literature being the only black hole, this would, be the, this would have been the Hawking page transition temperature. Okay? And we can compute it rigorously from our entropy function. It's just given by inverse temperature is somehow given by this in the unit of ADS radius. Okay? So unlike a long belief, and I, I, I try to persuade you that it's, uh, it has been a wrong belief, the index of four-dimensional conformal field theory sees the holographic dual BPS black holes in ADS5. I illustrated it in the large black hole limit because it's technically simple and most robust thing. I developed that the large black hole limit of known black holes turns out to be the dominant saddle point of the thermodynamics in ADS5 times F5 in the large black hole limit. Tomorrow I'll show that away from this limit, a lot of more complicated things will happen. But you don't have to use alternative effective description. You can study some things depending on how many techniques you have, the same index and see new phenomena. We'll be even able to predict new black holes, which haven't been found yet in the literature. <coughs> they have some character, some of them have some characteristic features similar to what's called the hairy black holes, which have been just began, be, which are just beginning to be constructed uh, numerically. Some remaining questions, of course, is since we counted these kinds of black holes from an index, in principle, there should be a way of seeing all this macroscopic number of BPS operators, even at weak coupling. There has been a lot of studies um, more than 10 years ago, including myself, and I forgot to cite it, but this ingenious trial by uh, Bocuse and collaborators. But they all failed to find, find explicit constructions of BPS operators carrying large charges and macroscopic entropy. Trying to understand this in concrete detail will definitely be desirable, but it might be quite challenging because you need some ansatz in principle for constructing these BPS operators. You close the, the, the Q cohomology and, and be modded out by Q exact operators and so on. It has some technical complications. So the topics that I'll discuss tomorrow are the further studies of this index beyond the Cardi limit in which I will find black hole-like physics in the sectors where known black holes just don't exist. So this probably will be predicting new black holes at a point. And I, I'll do it by illustrating in two different ways. I'll, I'll be studying a different sector of the index called McDonald limit. And all, also, along the language of eigenvalue distributions and so on, I'll show you that a deconfinement transition from the index should be visible, and this again turns out to predict new black holes in an indirect way. Tomorrow I'll describe an alternative anomaly-based derivation of the higher dimensional cardi-like free energy for all even-dimensional CFTs. 
Depending on time, I'm going to briefly mention some works in progress about even dimensional DPS ADS black holes using odd dimensional conformal field theory. Those dimensions are either smaller or larger than four. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did not understand the full details of your talk, but uh, my impression is that your technique seems to be very similar yeah. to so called dying Fowler method in statistical mechanics. What's that? Oh, so probably I have to tell you, uh, the, you, you can find it in Huang's book, for example, and the idea is that you re, uh, partition function is in general a function of uh, temperature and chemical potential, of course, and in their method, they regard temperature and chemical potential to be complex variable and regard the partition function. Originally, it was just a uh, real function of temperature and the, uh, chemical potential, but after they elevated it as a complex analytic function, uh -huh. Then they study analytic or singularity structure of the partition function. What structure? Uh, singularity structure, oh, like a branch I point see. or whatever. Yeah. So they, uh, by investigating such a singularity structure, they find the phase transitions. That's the uh, basic idea of dying Fowler method. Okay. And uh, my impression is that your technique seems to be very similar, at least in uh, spirit, to that. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, uh, apparently I introduced it for. Um, so you here, your main yeah, point probably, is... Yeah, only after complexifying, I see some singularity yeah, yes, yes, of phase yes. transition. So yeah, yeah. My, yeah, although I believe there's no minus signs in it. Um, I mean, my, my basic idea is that I'm trying to obstruct the post Fermi cancellation, but, so, but, but whose structure I'm not, I, I'm sure won't be there in Huang's book, but... Uh, of course not, yeah, yeah, so... Yeah, I, 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 I'll superficially agree, yeah, yeah, that. Only after complexifying, I see phase transition. I, I, I think that structure will be made even more precise in tomorrow's lecture. Mm -hmm. Only after suitably complexifying, only after that you see phase transition. So in that sense, it mm -hmm. might be simpler. So, yeah. maybe, similar, sorry. Yeah. so maybe my suggestion is that yeah. you may regard your index as yeah. a, just a full complex analytic function of yeah. Ma yeah. Uh, many complex variables so that you may systematically search for all the singularity structure, then yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. there may be just the one. Thank you, I'll read Huang's book. I did my graduate studies very badly, so <laughs> uh, I don't remember all the concepts. I, I definitely read Huang's book and yeah, see yeah. if I can learn. It's only in the first edition, not in second edition. Ah, I see, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead. So if you consider omega uh, like uh, temperature, then do you- Inverse temperature. Uh, inverse temperature, then do you expect the PPS black holes will satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, yeah, definitely they satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. To check? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, yeah, yeah. Just energy conservation. Yeah. Yes, all right. So uh, I'm a little bit confused about the imaginary part of the entropy that you got. So you got some imaginary part from the index if you don't impose the charge relation, right? Uh, but uh, the entropy itself must be real, so. Well, from the field theory point of view. Well, yeah, yeah, but 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 suppose you count one state, the right. complex fugacity. But you get the imaginary part of the exponent. Well, but if you, yeah, if you compute something with fugacity, then it's kind of natural that with complex fugacity, then it, then it's natural that you get some complex answer. But I thought you are kind of doing Laplace transformation yeah. or the genre transformation. Yeah. So, so really I, I stick to the extremized point, that the right. other point of this chem chemical potential. So so you're. You're expecting that like uh, there is some... Oh, you're feeling some tension with hermeticity of the theory? Right. Yeah, yeah, so, so what I find is the following. So, yeah, when you find a solution with real part of entropy plus some non-zero imaginary part, there's always another saddle point with same real part okay. but flip sign of right. imaginary right. part. So you, you find two. Okay. So shifting the chemical potential this way or that way do, will do equal job probably. That, that's, that's my thinking, yeah. So there was a question there. Do you find some sort of unexpected modular-like properties of your index? Uh, modular properties? Yes. Low high temperature? Yes. Uh, there are some hints of that. Um, I tried not to pay attention to that, but there are some hints of that. So high temperature limit uh, is given by what I've given you. The low temperature limit, the dominant part, will be just zero if it gets dominant contribution from vacuum one. But it may be non-trivial if you formally include the zero-point energy contribution because you're in the curved space. Right? If you include this part, we call it Casimir energy, supersymmetric Casimir energy. 
If you include that, I get the impression that the low temperature dominant part given by cosmic energy and the high temperature dominant part given by my expression take similar functional form. So probably there will be some kind of modularity. I find some weak hints of that, but developing the full structure, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, there are some hints of that modular like. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, to your right. To your right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> basically, uh, when you add, uh, I, I, you didn't. I, I don't think you wrote an explicit Lagrangian. Yeah. So when you add matter sector to the kinds of, uh, uh, basically, what happens is these deltas, these fugacities or chemical potentials, they are actually constrained. Uh, generally, for for example, when you add bifundamentals to your theory, etc. So, so you have matter sector. When I, add, when I add by fundamentals, the chemical potentials are constrained? Yeah, when you add like a matter, some matter which is in the by fundamental of a representation. Generally, I'm talking along the theories which are like essentially quiver gauge theories. So you, your, these deltas are exactly uh, constrained in the sense like your delta AB plus delta BA is something, something. So do you see any problem like since you are complexifying these deltas in some, I mean, do you, do you anticipate any problem in, in satisfying those relations? Well, well, you're complexifying the chemical potential, which are satisfying any relation that, I mean, you know, you only complexify independent chemical potential parameters. Okay. If quivers are satisfying certain chemical potential relations, you only satisfy, you only complexify the independent component satisfying such relations, whatever that is. I'm never getting beyond any physical constraints. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, omega 1 equals omega 2, then, then what happens for the temperature? So what is the, how do you define oh, you the know, since two angular momentum for, ang so, so two chemical potential for angular momentum are equal, it transforms to a configuration with equal angular momentum, J1 and J2 being equal on R4 or S3. If chemical what potentials are equal, the conjugate charges are equal. Okay, what if omega 1 is different from omega 2? Well, 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 we, we, well, we have a completely general formula. We've counted large black holes with different J1 and J2, with different omega 1. We did that. I mean, then how do you interpret the temperature with omega 1? And as, as I said, all four independent chemical potentials are sharing the role of temperature. You know, J1 contributes to BPS energy, J2 contributes to BPS energy, Q1 contributes to BPS energy. So the, the role of temperature is split. I mean, because the role of energy is split into five charges. All chemical potential, all five, of, all four of them, are constrained to be positive, just like the inverse temperature is positive. Yeah. Yeah. And if you increase these temperature-like variables, the conjugate positive charge increases. They all behave sort of like temperatures and energies, because it's BPS sector. Charges have low bound. In a sense, all of them behave like energies. All right. Any more question? If not, let's thank uh, uh, Professor Kim again.